backstory about Harlow and I. Um, Harlow is my pup and you've probably seen him a lot on my social media. He is my uh, logo for my company. So when I got Harlow, I just started dog training and learning how to be a dog trainer. And to be honest, Harlow was a handful. <laughs> um, and I didn't manage him properly because I wasn't sure exactly what I was doing. I was just learning. I didn't have a plan when it came to his socialization and I definitely missed some key pieces in it. And when I did need help, I didn't seek it. So those are the few mistakes that I made with him. So all that to say is that I've been exactly where you are, where you're struggling with your puppy as a new parent, I've been there as well. And so imagine if you were better prepared to set up your puppy for success with methods that are fun and effective and you feel good about using them. Uh, that you are guided through the process and you don't feel like you're all alone and you have all the information that you need at your fingertips. So especially with being online uh, and having the internet, we can search everything and there's so much contradicting information out there that it can be very overwhelming and very confusing. So a little bit about me, my name is Catherine and I am a certified and professional dog trainer with eight years of experience. I'm a graduate from the Academy for Dog Trainers. I'm a certified separation anxiety trainer. I'm also fear-free certified and I'm a puppy start right instructor with Karen Pryor Academy. So along with my experience with uh, private clients, I've worked in two different shelters. So the Montreal SPCA and Humane Society International. And with both shelters, we did a lot of puppy raising, had lots of puppies in our care, especially at HSI. Lots of mommies that came through. So my vision with Dog Inspired is to inspire you through education and compassion. And I am fully committed to helping new puppy parents raise their puppies using humane and science-based methods. Hi, Maya. <laughs> so today I'm sharing some lessons from my online course and my book, Puppy Life Skills. So the online course is a four week program online and has detailed tutorials and lots of information. And I just recently came out with the book to go along with it. So this is what I'm sharing from. So, I'm gonna be sharing some tips on helping you raise your puppy. So we're gonna talk about socialization, reading dog body language, what are normal puppy behaviors, how to handle puppy biting, and I'm gonna share three skills that you should teach your puppy. So when should you start socializing your pup? So this phase in their social development is between the ages of three to 12 weeks. It's a little bit more, a little bit less. It varies, it definitely varies between breed, but most of us do agree that it's about between three to 12 weeks of age. So whether you acquired your puppy from a breeder, a shelter or a rescue, they should be starting their puppies on a thorough socialization program. So when puppy comes home, they should already have a solid foundation with socialization. Now, the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior says that puppies are ready to socialize one week after their first set of vaccinations, which means puppies are ready to go do puppy socialization classes as of eight weeks of age, so as soon as they come home. And so socialization is the best form of prevention when it comes to fear, anxiety, and aggression. It helps prevent relinquishment due to unwanted behaviors like barking, reactivity, fear of strangers, being mouthy, be a jumpy. So it is your top priority for the first couple of weeks. So when we're talking about socialization, we're talking about introducing our puppy to a wide variety of experiences, including meeting people, animals, objects, going to new places, sounds, body handling. So there's so many um, experiences that we want to introduce to them. However, we also wanna be actively creating positive experiences for them. 
And so the best way to do that is use food, play, and praise. So I'm going to share in the comments a link to download this free guide. So it's a socialization guide that has a detailed list of all the things you need to check off while socializing your puppy. It also has lots of tips on how to help create positive associations and do it properly. So when we're creating positive associations, we, are, we wanna be actively doing it. We wanna make sure that we're prepared and this means having lots of yummy treats on us. So let's say when we're out on a walk and we're passing by a children's playground, the children running and yelling and being obnoxious because they're children <laughs> and we're walking in front of it with our puppy. The best thing that we can do is be, oh, look, there's children. What a nice puppy. Here's some cheese and have a cheese party. Just a few moments and then say, okay, let's go. And then you can walk away and continue on your way. And so by doing this, you're showing to your puppy that children and hearing these loud sounds and these weird objects in the park are fantastic. Exactly, Mari, we make it rain cheese. And so if ever you notice that your puppy is a little bit uncomfortable in this situation, there's different things that we can do to make them feel better. So the next time we pass by this park, instead of walking on the same side of the street, we can walk on the opposite side of the street, or we can stay at the corner and then turn another way but still when they hear, your puppy hears sounds of children and sees them, we make it rain cheese. <laughs> Creating those positive associations and using happy talk as well. What a good puppy. Oh, you're so fun. Look at the children. It's so wonderful. And then we continue on our way, making it super fun and positive for them. So when we're socializing our puppy, we do need to learn signs of stress. So this is a way to detect any sort of fear or anxiety in our dog. So like the example with the children's playground, if I have a puppy who's showing me signs of stress and I'm not exactly sure what I'm looking for, it's possible that I miss it. And even though we're trying to actively create positive associations, I could be flooding them. So making my puppy feel overwhelmed by all this new stimulation, sounds and sights, and children running, it could be very overwhelming for them. And so it's important to learn these signs of stress. So here's a couple, there's a whole long list of signs of stress and these are just a few that I plucked out. So ears back is a pretty easy one to see. So normally the ears are forward or in a neutral position, uh, but when they start to be uncomfortable or nervous about something, they'll put their ears all the way to the back tail tucked. We know that one very well when they tuck their tail between their, their, tail between their legs. Uh, wide eyes with a lot of white, which is what we call whale eye. They could also be looking away from whatever it is that's making them uncomfortable. So let's say if I'm staring at a puppy, I'm like, oh, hello puppy. It's possible they turn their head away from me to say, this is too much. You're too much and I'm uncomfortable. Um, blinking eyes, yawning, panting, licking their nose and a big one is they stop taking food. So what's important to keep in mind is that some of the signs of stress could be contradicting to what we previously thought dog body language meant. So for example, when dogs look away or they kind of tuck their tail and they, you know, they're avoiding eye contact, we sometimes feel like that's our dog acting like he's guilty. But in reality, it's not a dog being guilty. It's a dog who is afraid of something and it's actually a sign of stress. So let's look at this puppy here. Um, what do you see? Look at this picture and tell me what signs of stress that you notice. So take a moment, right in the chat box, what signs of stress do you see in this puppy? I'll give you a few moments. Yes. Panting, ears back, excellent. Yes, winking a little, I'm not sure about this. Yeah. Yep, so we definitely see the ears are back. There's a little bit of whale eye in there. So we see the white in the eye over here. This pup is definitely panting. It could be 
any sort of reason why they're showing these signs. It could be the camera, it could be the person, maybe there's a lot going on in their surroundings and the environment that's making them uncomfortable. Give you a whole lot of reasons, but we do see signs that this pup is not super comfortable. So I listed all the signs here. It could also be that the pup's blinking too, why he's his eyes are a little bit wonky in this uh, in this photo, and he's slightly looking away as well. Great. Let's look at another picture. This little pup. What do you see? Signs of stress. Oh, I know. Such a cute little puppy too. Yeah, he's scared. Does not look happy. Does not look comfortable. So or just write in the chat box, what do you see? Don't be shy. It's okay. A little Yoda ears. <laughs> yeah, so lots of whites in the eyes. We see the big whale eye over here. The ears are down, it's cowering. Yep. Great, everyone. So yes, we see the ears are definitely back. We see lots of white in his eye compared to the last pup. He's looking away from the camera. So it could be the person behind the camera. It could be anything in the environment, just like the other pup. He is slightly cowering. And this pup also has his, his mouth closed. So compared to the last one who was panting, having a closed mouth is also a, a sign of stress. Keep in mind, you have to look at context. So if your pup just woke up and they yawned, we can assume that they yawned because they're tired. If your pup is interacting with someone and they suddenly yawn, well, I would bet more money that maybe the interaction is stressing them. So definitely look at context when we're talking about signs of stress. Um, being able to spot signs of stress is an acquired skill that takes a lot of practice. So practicing observing your puppy, observing puppies and dogs around you. And when you start noticing these signs of stress more and more often, you'll see those cute videos that you see on TikTok or on Instagram or Facebook are no longer cute because it's actually dogs showing many signs of stress. So practice your eye, um, try and spot them in your own pup and in the videos you see online. So what do we do if we see signs of stress? We wanna help our puppy feel comfortable. So we can do this by increasing distance. So let's say like the example of the playground, the next time that I walk by the playground, instead of being on the same side of the street, I'll be across the street. So it's a way to increase distance and make it a little bit less overwhelming for our puppy. We can take a break. So let's say you're going to a puppy socialization class um, and there's a lot going on. There's lots of puppies, it's barky, there's people moving around. It could be very overwhelming. And so you can take a break by bringing your puppy to go pee outside, give them a breather, and then see if they're ready to go back and work a little bit after taking a break. You'll also want to take note of the situation. So let's say like the playground example, uh, your puppy seemed a little bit uncomfortable, maybe didn't want to walk by it, was trying to run away, showing signs of stress. I could assume that it's the children that's making them stressed out. It could be something else completely in the environment, but taking note of the situation will help you figure out what your puppy's triggers are. And then of course, bring higher value food. Higher value food is different for each dog. So for mine, it's anything that's edible. <laughs> they're not picky at all. So I can give them cheese and they're just as enthusiastic for dried liver. Um, but I have worked with a Great Dane before where I brought him hot dogs and I brought him hamburger meat and steak and prosciutto. Oh my God, name the meat. I bought it for him and he turned his nose up at every single one. <laughs> the only thing that worked for this pup was uh, cheese. That was it. That was the only, his only high value was cheese. So where my guys would have ate all of that instantly, he was like, yeah, no, no. So you're gonna need to audition different types of high value foods with your dog. So normal behaviors, it might come to a surprise because a lot of these are problem behaviors or unwanted behaviors. So digging, chewing, biting, jumping up, foraging for food, chasing, barking, and sniffing. 
And I'm really curious to know how many of you deal with any of these behaviors, you know, on a daily basis with your dog. So what does your dog do that kind of <laughs> is in one of these categories? So my dogs, they dig and there's holes all over my backyard. <laughs> they definitely jump up and forage for food as well. All of them. <laughs> Yeah, they all enjoy, they enjoy all of these, but the ones that I get the most is definitely foraging for food with Harlow. He's a great Dane. Um, so hiding food higher up doesn't exist with him. <laughs> My whole kitchen is puppy proofed for him, baby proof for him as well. Don't be shy. You can tell me what, what, what issues you deal with with your dogs. I'm very honest with mine. <laughs> They're not perfect. Barking, digging. <laughs> fighting, jumping up. See, and this is where we see that, you know, all of our dogs do this. They all jump up, they all bark, they all bite. <laughs> they love to chew. And so it kind of makes you feel a little bit less alone because you realize like, oh, everyone deals with this. And they're like, yes, because it's normal. It's dog behavior, it's totally normal. And so even though it's normal, it can be uncomfortable or even um, unpleasant. And so there are things that we can do to make it better for your dog and obviously for yourself as well. So um, most of these behaviors, like I said, are unwanted, they're unpleasant, they're problematic, but they're only a problem to us because most of these are your dog's favorite pastime. So there's a couple of things that we can do. And first is to set realistic expectations. Not everything needs to be fixed. Your dog is not broken. And if these behaviors don't bother you, so my dog's jumping up on me, doesn't bother me, so I don't fix it. Um, obviously when I have guests some come over, I will manage, which is point number two, manage our puppy to prevent uh, behaviors from occurring when it's not appropriate. So my dog's jumping on me doesn't bother me, but on guests, I don't want my big Great Dane to jump on people. So I do manage him to make sure he doesn't do it. And then three, we provide legal outlets that are natural instinctive behaviors. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about that. So first we're gonna talk about management. Um, when we're managing, we want to puppy proof our house. We want to tidy up. We want to hide wires, hide plants, put our shoes away. So just make sure that there's nothing that is lying around for our pup to chew on. Um, we want to keep doors closed to the bathroom and to the bedrooms. We can use gates to prevent access to certain areas. So I have gates in the entrance to my dining room and into my kitchen to prevent the dogs from going in there while we're eating. I have a toddler who likes to throw food at the dog. So that's why I use it so much or else I wouldn't have them. <laughs> but management is very good with puppies as well. And so we definitely want to supervise our puppy when they're free in the house or in the yard, especially if our puppy likes to dig um, and we just let them go roam in the yard by themselves. They will definitely keep themselves occupied by digging or chewing or eating things they're not supposed to. So there's a few things that we can do when we can't actively supervise our puppy. One, we can keep them on leash. Um, this is a great way, let's say if you're watching TV, you're working, um, you're cooking dinner, just to keep them close by, they're still able to move around and still can be next to you, but they can't walk off into another area. Um, you can use a puppy proof space. So you can use a crate, a playpen, or even a puppy proof room. So anything that will keep them out of trouble that they have their stuff and it's puppy proof so they can't chew on anything they're not supposed to. Okay, so legal outlets. This means letting your dog be a dog by providing them with outlets for their natural instinctive behaviors and is a way to fulfill their needs. The best thing to do is to look up what your dog was bred for so you'll see some dogs are really into digging while others are into chasing, others like to forage. So look up your dog's breed and see what sort of characteristics come with it. So there's ways that we can provide legal outlets. So this means that if our dog likes to dig, we can set up a dip sand pit in the backyard. Um, a great way to encourage them to use their sand pit is by hiding treats and hiding toys in it and encouraging them to use it. And managing them while they're outside. So supervising them or keeping them on leash so they can't go off into your garden and dig up your plants. 
we're going to give our dogs bones for chewing. Chewing is a favorite pastime in this house, um, as is for most dogs. And you'll see for chews, it depends just like treats. So here, the fan favorites are yak chews, antlers, and bully sticks. But honestly, I can get away with any type of chew. Whereas I had a client with a German Shepherd puppy and I actually brought this puppy <laughs> to the store with me to choose a chew because we could literally find nothing. So I brought her to the store. I let her sniff out all the chews and nothing, nothing, nothing. She turned her nose up to everything. We walked by the toy section. She went bananas. I bought her a toy and she was the happiest little pup. So some dogs are not into chewing or maybe they're very specific on what they like to chew on, uh, something soft like a plush toy and a stuffy, but providing chews for our dogs so they can let out <laughs> those natural behaviors in a way that is appropriate. Um, puzzle feeders are great for foragers. Most dogs are foragers. Forager would be they're trying to go through the garbage or they're jumping on the counter or they're stealing food. Um, we definitely want to encourage them to use their nose and to harness this energy to want to forage in a way that is appropriate. So giving them puzzle feeders. And then we have some dogs who also like to sniff. So sports like nose work are really great. So these are just a couple of ideas. So the puppy life skills book is packed with information on all the topics and especially including uh, normal puppy behavior. So I go into even more detail on how to set up uh, suitable management and lots of uh, examples of how to provide legal outlets for your puppy's natural behaviors. So the book is actually available to purchase as an ebook on my website and in paperback on Amazon. So I will put the link to Amazon in the chat. So this way, if you are interested in purchasing the book paperback, you can do so and it's on Amazon. All right, so puppy biting. This is a big topic. One of the questions I get asked most. So puppy biting is usually normal. Um, it's how they explore their environment. It's how they play, but it's also how they express themselves when they're uncomfortable. So this is why I say it's usually normal. Uh, puppy biting is usually play, but sometimes they will bite when they are uncomfortable. They don't have super strong jaws, so they can't do that much damage, even though their teeth are pretty pointy, um, and, but it's still very, very uncomfortable. So when we're dealing with a fearful biter, um, it's because they're uncomfortable. It could be because they're uncomfortable with being touched, with us taking something away, or when they're eating. Uh, it could be towards a person in particular, it could be towards other animals like dogs or whatnot. So again, like in the socialization and um, signs of stress part of the webinar that we talked about, taking note of which context or what sort of triggers make your puppy feel uncomfortable. So this way we can help be proactive and make them feel better about it. So extreme fear and shyness in young puppies is a red flag. So like I said before, we want to write down those triggers. We want to create positive associations using high value food. And of course, if you feel like you're way in over your head, definitely reach out for help. Okay. Um, okay, so puppy play biting. <laughs> um, play biting is usually accompanied with uh, play postures. So it could be bouncy movements. It could be like a play face. So it looks like they're grinning and play bows. So we can definitely tell when it's play biting versus fearful biting. Um, there is possibly some growling, which is totally normal during puppy play. They could be showing their teeth, also very normal. Um, it can happen. Puppy play could happen when you're not actively playing with them. So let's say you get up and you're moving around or you're just sitting on the couch it's possible that they just start biting you to play. Um, and this is all super normal stuff, definitely unpleasant. <laughs> and so I'm gonna give you a few tips now just to help you um, navigate puppy play biting. So first tip is to redirect with a toy. Obviously you have all heard this one um, and I know it doesn't always work. So there's ways to get your puppy to be redirected on with a toy. So if you just put a toy in front of their face like this, 
yeah, it's not going to work. <laughs> it's going to be boring. You're flailing your limbs around, which is super fun compared to a toy you're just placing in front of their face. Not so interesting. So you might consider playing a game of tug or fetch or even getting them out of puzzle theater. So something that would really take their attention, <clears throat> but it doesn't always work. And so I suggest redirecting with food, which is scattering treats on the ground and saying, go find it or search. Redirecting with food, like a scatter and asking them to go find it is a way to get them off of your arm. So you just need them to get off. I would grab a couple of treats. I always have a jar of treats close by when I'm training. My dogs don't bite me, but when they're puppies, they did. Um, have a jar of treats close by. I used to have them in my living room, in my kitchen, in my office, like they were everywhere. So when they would do that, I would grab a couple of treats, toss them on the ground and say, go find it. So this way they can let go of me. And I have a, have a chance to go redirect them with something else, whether it's a toy or a puzzle theater. So you might notice that there's certain moments of the day where it's like witching hour or your puppy seems to be just going absolutely bananas on you. And this is just like a pent up of energy where they're just going nuts. And this is totally normal. This is something that all dogs do. So there's a few things that we do to help curb it. First is physical exercise. So playing fetch with your dog, with your puppy, going for walks, playing tug. So we wanna definitely meet that physical need for them. We want to provide them with chews, bones, and puzzle feeders to help them with the chewing. Play opportunities with other friendly adult dogs and puppies. So other dogs and puppies are your puppy's best teachers. The more that they practice their skills and hone them, the better they'll get at it. So they'll learn to control their mouth a lot better. So it helps so much that they get to play with other dogs. The other tip is to encourage downtime. So have them relax and take a nap. You can put them in their crate with a Kong or put them on their pillow with a Kong. You can get them a massage or cuddle on the couch, but just encouraging them to, encouraging them to relax. So kind of like children, um, puppies do get a little bit rambunctious when they're tired, like with children. And so it's important that they do get enough sleep. So when they're overly tired, they get really silly. So downtime and naps. Next, we'll wanna teach a couple new skills that will help them learn better associations or how to um, interact with us. So for example, touch is when they touch our hand. This teaches them to boop their nose onto our hand instead of biting our hands. So this is a really great way to help with puppy biting. Teaching them body handling. So if your puppy is a bit of a fearful biter or doesn't let you pet them without biting, teaching them body handling is a great way to create positive associations with your hands coming towards their body or being touched or restrained. Then teaching leave it or drop it are also really great skills to teach that help with biting. <clears throat> so we're gonna go over a quick video. Um, this is a preview of my puppy life skills course. So these are videos that you'll see throughout the course, they're tutorials, and I show you how to do each skill step-by-step. Step. So I break it down to steps. I show you with me working with a puppy, <laughs> not one of my own dogs, and, um, and just guide you through the process. So touch is really useful for teaching focus, teaching recall, helps with biting, like I mentioned just before. And you can also use it to teach them to ring a bell. So here, let's look at the video together. I don't think there's sound. If you hear sound, let me know. If you don't hear sound, let me know. Just let me know in the chat box. So the first step is we're gonna hold a treat in our hand underneath our thumb kind of like doing the number four with our hand. So the treat is gonna be underneath our thumb. Then we're gonna present our hand to our puppy. What we're looking for is that our puppy sniffs out the treat. So they're coming to sniff our hand. And as soon as they put their nose onto our hand, we say yes, and then we reward. So let's take a look at the video. So it's just a little boop to the hand.
so you see how you, this can help with puppy biting <laughs> so it's teaching them a new way to interact with our hands and definitely creating a positive association to our hands as well so this is a fun little preview of what you can expect in the course So I want to go over a little checklist of recommended gear. So I definitely recommend a front clip harness. If your pup is a little bit small, having a front clip harness might not be ideal. So you want something that clips onto the back. Harnesses do not teach your dog to pull. <laughs> Big misconception. Um, but the front clip harness, like I said, if your pup's too small, the leash will be right in front of their face, which is a little bit uncomfortable. And so totally possible that they bite the leash if it's in front of their face. <clears throat> I suggest having a standard six foot leash, not a retractable. Those are very dangerous, um, but make sure you check with your city what your leash laws are. I think normally six feet passes for everywhere, but just uh, make sure to check. Just as a standard leash and not a retractable. Having a variety of toys. So with Harlow, when he was a puppy, to make toys last longer, I used to do a rotation. So I'd have a couple of toys in the closet, a couple of toys free, and then I would swap them once a week. Um, just to make them more interesting for him again to play with all of his toys. Um, puzzle feeders. So instead of feeding your puppy in a bowl, which takes 10 seconds for them to finish, using a pup, uh, puzzle feeder can extend their feeding time and keep them busy for a little bit longer. They don't need to work for every meal, but it's a great way to encourage them uh, and keep them busy and work their mental energy into something constructive. So I highly suggest puzzle feeders. Kong is a great one. So for example, if I feed my dogs in a bowl, it probably takes them about 20 seconds to eat their food. If I feed them in the Kong, I can probably get about 30 minutes. And if depending what I stuff it with, I can get an hour, which is amazing. <laughs> so I love puzzle feeders. Like I said, they don't have to eat, they don't have to work for every meal, but it is a great way to um, just focus their energy and get them to work on something, especially when it's cold out or when it's raining and it's not so ideal. So these are great ways to keep your pup occupied. Uh, a dog bed or mat, uh, different chews. So I mentioned earlier that my dogs like yak chews and antlers and, um, well, they really will chew anything, but like I said before, you would have to audition which chews are your pup's favorite. I also encourage you to start brushing your puppy's teeth as soon as possible. So this is something I'm going to be adding to the puppy course soon, is a tutorial on how to get started on brushing their teeth. Um, having training treats, so like with the chews, you're going to have to audition which ones are your pup's favorite. And then having a treat pouch so you're always ready to reward your pup. Um, so this is a question, I'm going to answer it. Are there any good dog beds that are chew proof? My puppy chewed through the bed we got her. So I really don't think so. I had a client who bought a mat, kind of like a bed that Kong makes. They bought it in the States um, that seemed pretty durable, but it didn't seem super comfy. Like it kind of seemed like a foam mat, but just made out of like plastic. So it was a little bit more durable. Um, if your puppy has the tendency to chew through their, um, their beds, I would probably use just like a old blanket or a towel that you don't really care about that much instead until she kind of learns or grows out of that um, chewing bed behavior. Definitely provide her with alternatives like chews and puzzle feeders to encourage her to chew other stuff besides, besides her bed. And when you feel confident that she is, you know, she knows what's what's to chew and what isn't, then you can um, bring back some dog beds. But I would use something that you don't really care about that's not too expensive, like an old towel or a blanket. Hope that answered your question. So uh, next topic is building new skills. So along with legal outlets and management, we want to build new skills to help prevent unwanted behaviors. Skills we use in our day-to-day -day will help with our dogs, such as with dog, uh, door manners, counter surfing, jumping, and stealing objects. So it's important to keep in mind that dogs can learn at any age. There's no time sensitivity when it comes to obedience type uh, skills. So socialization is time sensitive, which means it's a priority and you only have until 12 weeks old to get all of that done. 
So if your time and energy is limited, obedience skills can definitely wait. Now, I'm sure you're going to want to practice exercises with your puppy when you're not socializing. So here are the three that I highly recommend practicing instead of things like sitting down. So um, stay on a mat is probably the skill that I use on a daily basis with my own dogs. I use it for everything and it's super handy. So I use it with my dogs for greeting. So like I mentioned, like I'll probably manage Harlow, um, but my other dogs, I'll put them on there. I'll ask them to stay on their mat and let people come in. Um, I use it for when I'm preparing dinner and when I'm eating dinner. So they have their spot in the corner with their mat. They know to go there. If they want anything that's on the counter, you have to go in the corner to get it. <laughs> so it is super handy in the kitchen. It also helps with jumping and encouraging downtime. So stay on a mat, super useful. Leash skills is another skill that I suggest uh, practicing and prioritizing if you want to teach your puppy certain obedience skills. Um, I don't really like that word, but <laughs> just so everyone understands what I mean. Um, good leash skills means we will go out for walks more often, and it means that our dog might get to go out on fun outings with us. So leash skills is also really great to practice. And then coming when called is life saving. So a little story, Harlow, when he was a puppy, um, got out of the house. And so what happened was I ordered pizza. I realized when I got to the door, I didn't have enough uh, money for tip. So I went back, I forgot to close the vestibule door behind me and Harlow snuck behind me, opened the crack of the door. He scared <laughs> the living daylights out of the delivery driver, which I mean is understandable. Harlow's huge, he's a great Dane and very dark and intimidating looking. So the guy just moved out of the way, was like, oh, and then Harlow bolted out the door and ran down the street. I nearly had a heart attack. Um, his recall was not what it is today. Like I said, I made a lot of mistakes when raising him. I was learning and um, yeah, this is where I say it is life-saving. So things like this will happen. Someone's gonna leave the door open. Someone's gonna leave the gate open. The leash might get dropped. And so you wanna make sure that your dog has a super solid recall. So coming when called is why it's one of my top three skills to teach your puppy. So uh, before we wrap up, I also want to mention that I offer private consultations. So if ever you need help with your puppy, uh, please reach out and we can work together. You can actually book directly from my website. And I have a whole bunch of different uh, packages available for training. So please feel free to ask me any questions. And those for you, those of you who are watching the recording, you can ask questions in the comments section and I'll be happy to answer them. Um, so if you have any questions, I will answer them now. I think I saw one or two at the beginning. So I'm just going to scroll back. Um, so a dog chewed some portion of a soft toys. So uh, if your dog chews toys, as long as they don't ingest them, it should be fine. Um, if you notice that they do ingest them, I would not give them those toys because I wouldn't want to you to go to the vet with your pup. <laughs> um, is a 12 week socialization period for all ages breeds, not 16 weeks. Um, so like I said before, when we're talking about socialization and, and the time frame of it, it depends on breed. It depends on a whole lot of factors. We say about 12 weeks, everyone can agree on that. Um, it could be 16 weeks. It could be a little bit more like 18 or 20, um, but to just really, emphasize how important it is. That's why I like to say 12 weeks, just to make it a little bit more <laughs> of a priority and realize like, oh, I just have four weeks to do this. And so saying like, oh, I got two months, I'll get to it. So it helps uh, real help people realize how much of a priority it is. Um, okay. How do I stop a puppy from crying most of the time and make sure everything is okay? So that depends what context that they're crying in. Are they crying when they're in their crate? Are they crying while you're working on the computer? Are they crying at the door? Um, it could be a whole variety of reasons. So puppies do vocalize like dogs. 
dogs vocalize whenever there's a need not being met and there's something that they need. So it could be literally anything. Um, and so we want to just make sure that their needs are met. So you might notice like, okay, maybe my puppy is bored and that's why they're crying. And I gave them a Kong and I gave them a chew to, to, to gnaw on and what else can I do? So there's other things that we can do to meet their needs to help them, you know, fill their cup. So this way they don't need to bug us for attention. So making sure that we give them enough exercise, even if we're giving them enrichment, sometimes it might mean they need more. Maybe we're giving too much and they're overstimulated. So you might need to play with how much you do with your puppy and see what's the best ratio for it. And definitely encouraging downtime. Um, if ever you need a little bit more help and more guidance, please feel free to reach out. Um, you're welcome. What are some safe chews for puppies? So if you're ever not sure, you can ask when you go to the pet store or when you go visit your veterinarian. Like I mentioned earlier, the fan favorites here are yak chews and antlers and bully sticks. All of these are pretty safe for puppies. I do think yak chews are a little bit too uh, hard for their teeth. So they might not be too interested in it. Um, bully sticks are really great. And the antlers are great too, especially if they're, they're split in half. Um, but you would have to see what your puppy likes. For some dogs, you might be, for, and for some people, you might end up buying a couple of different ones and your puppy never touches them. Trial and error, <laughs> unfortunately, for some dogs. Um, I did this with my first dog. I tried a whole bunch and he was just not interested. I bought like a bag of sweet potatoes and never touched it. It was such a waste. But uh, what's great now is that they offer, um, uh in like kind of like at bulk barn where you can just like grab a little bit of everything so what same thing at pet stores you can just like grab one true and test it out with your puppy instead of buying a whole bag um, but just seeing what they like and you can definitely ask uh someone at the store or your veterinarian if ever you're not sure if it's safe for your puppy gorilla chews are a hit here too oh, i've never tried gorilla chews i'm i'm super interested in trying that with harlow he loves to chew they all love wood here, so that would probably go very well. So that seems to be all the questions for tonight. Um, I want to thank you all so much for joining me in this webinar. I hope you found the content useful and feel inspired to take your next step in your amazing journey with your puppy. Um, and please feel free to reach out if you need anything. So you can message me on Instagram. It's at doginspire.ca. Uh, my website is doginspired.ca as well. And then my email is there, info at doginspired.ca. So thank you all so much for being here. It was a pleasure chatting with you. And I hope we get to talk soon. Like I said, please feel free to message me if there's anything. Have a great night.